What would Jesus say to you or your church if you met him today? What words of encouragement and what words of warning? Like a lot of people, I've always been really fascinated by the mystery and power of the final book of the Bible, the Revelation of John. And what particularly interests me is how the first three chapters of that book differ so much from the more prophetic later chapters in that Jesus is giving a series of messages to seven ancient churches about their needs and their problems and their people at that moment in their history. It's like we're treated to this little glimpse of how the early church used to work. Sixty years after his death and resurrection, Jesus gave a great prophecy or revelation to John, where he had a lot to say to the churches representing him, which had been quickly growing. And Jesus' seven messages and revelation are full of local colour that would have really rung true with those who received them. So I decided to travel around the ancient ring road where each of the seven churches can be found in modern day Turkey to see how Jesus' messages come to life when you discover their ancient context. His words of truth and wisdom speak to us just as much today as they did in the first century. Our journey begins on the Greek island of Patmos though, where John received the revelation that Jesus gave to him. Nowadays, Patmos is quite a classy and peaceful holiday location, and also it's a home to the rich and famous. But 2,000 years ago, this was a Roman penal colony, a guarded prison island where the emperor could send anyone who displeased him or seemed to be a troublemaker. And for the egotistical emperor Domitian, who thought he was a god, the preaching that Jesus is Lord was enough to get John banished to this island for several years. John is a man with a touch of mystery about him. Many Christians, including some of the early church fathers, believed him to be John the Apostle, Jesus' best friend, and the one who oversaw the writing of the Gospel of John. That's a somewhat romantic idea, and it's certainly possible. He would have been pretty old at that point, but ancient people did live into old age quite often. There's also a difference in writing style between Revelation and other works in the Bible by John, but then again he could have been dictating to somebody different, so it's still quite possible it was him. Alternatively, it could have been another well-known early church leader called John the Elder, or perhaps simply another itinerant prophet named John, who was trusted by the church. Well, whichever John it was, it's clear that this was a man who is full of the Holy Spirit, who is well known to the church, who knew his Bible inside out and who spoke with extreme authority. The prophecy he received was taken so seriously by the early church that it quickly formed part of the New Testament canon. And this is the way to the very cave in which John received his revelation about the end times for humankind. He was imprisoned in a very harsh place in miserable circumstances but he used his time to pray and worship in the spirit and God rewarded him with a huge vision with a great message about the present, the times that were near and times that were far away. John was writing in an age of great heroism within the church. Christians tended to be some of the poorest people in society but they were energized and motivated to drop what they were doing and sacrifice their time and energy, position and possessions for the growth of God's kingdom and the sharing of the message of Jesus. And what's very clear in Revelation and in what we know of the history of the time is that they faced serious opposition. Spiritual opposition with vast and wealthy Greco-Roman temples dotting the landscape and pagan worship infusing the culture and opposition also came from the reigning Emperor Domitian, who declared himself to be a god and became particularly antagonistic towards Christians, with John experiencing that firsthand. But in the face of all the odds, the power and love of Christians who were full of the Holy Spirit meant that Christianity continued to explode across the ancient world astonishingly quickly. Jesus' words to the seven churches of Revelation are powerful and encouraging and sometimes pretty disquieting. People occasionally get a false idea about Jesus, thinking that he was some kind of rabbinic, vaguely spiritual proto-hippie who was basically always cool with everything. 
But while Jesus is patient and loving and always humble and submissive to God, his Father, he is also always standing against sin, injustice and falsehood. As ready to warn of serious and even eternal consequences for our decisions and behaviour in this world, as he is ready to warmly embrace and hold on to and forgive all those who come to him for hope and new life. So, what truths might Jesus want to open up in the seven messages of Revelation about how you and your church are doing? Are you full of passion for the kingdom of God or maybe in need of a bit of building up and encouragement? Are you being visible Christians in your community, maybe even attracting a little trouble and persecution? Or are you surrendered to sleepiness? Is your teaching faithful to the word of God, the rock on which we stand? Or is it compromised to the whims and values of the society around us? Are you finding it easy to be loving? Or are you slipping into pride and indifference? Well, however you might be doing, the good news is that God loves us and wants to help us to become a beautiful church to represent him. And through these seven messages and revelation, he speaks to us as vividly today as he did 2,000 years ago. A reading from the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 1, from verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive for ever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, John, as a prophet, records this series of messages from Jesus to the Christians who lived in those seven ancient places, which can still be found today in modern Turkey. And these messages are Jesus' words to us today, just as relevant to us as they ever were. So as we go through this series of messages, listen out very carefully. See if the Holy Spirit is highlighting anything for you. It could be that God wants to encourage you today, or it could be that God is gently asking you or your church to repent of something, to turn away from something that's going wrong. The Holy Spirit lives inside Christians and he loves to open up the word of God for us, to bridge that 2000 year gap of history and culture to show us what Jesus wants to speak into our hearts today. To each of the seven churches found in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, Jesus starts by giving a symbolic reminder to us of who he is. The one who is the first and the last, the faithful and true witness, the one with a two-edged sword, the one who has the key of David, and we'll be looking at what each of those vivid descriptions mean. 
Then, each of the seven churches gets a message from him, which gives us a little window into how they were doing, and what Jesus' values and priorities are for his church. Some of them are doing well, despite facing problems and persecution, and they receive encouragement from him. Some are strong in many ways, but also in need of correction for something they're getting wrong, and one or two of them even get really chewed out. For example, the most positive thing Jesus has to say to the church in Laodicea is that he disciplines those he loves. In every church, we see strengths and weaknesses which still mark our own churches today, which we need to look out for. And the pattern that runs throughout is that Jesus wants us always to choose to be faithful to him and to the word of God, instead of compromising with the values of the world, which are so often in opposition to his own. And finally, each church receives a promise from Jesus for those who repent of doing anything wrong or who continue on in faithfulness instead of compromise. So even for the churches which seem most hopeless, there's always a chance being given to them to turn things around and to change. Jesus' messages often draw from their ancient reality. They carry references to the concerns of the people who lived in each of the seven places, their culture, their history, their problems, their geography, their religious and political issues of the day, even down to references to the kinds of coins they carried in their pockets. Jesus sees and knows all of these things. They form a part of his understanding and deep care for us. But before we discover more about the seven ancient churches of Revelation, let's take a closer look at John the prophet and how he managed to cope with the difficult situation he was in on the island of Patmos, see if we can learn anything from him. Now, John recorded Revelation in about AD 90. There's almost no dispute about that. And he probably did it with the help of a scribe to write things down for him. This was during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian, and about 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It was truly a heroic age for the Christian Church. The Emperor Domitian was at the head of the Roman Empire, which had brought a lasting peace to much of the known world, but at the edge of a sword. And Domitian himself, after starting his reign quite well in many ways, quickly came to see his empire as a divine monarchy, curtailing the power of the Roman Senate and allegedly giving himself the title Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. He also deified his brother Titus as well as his infant son and his niece, so as you can guess, he was particularly keen on encouraging the worship of Roman emperors, which caused a lot of problems for Christians because, of course, we refuse to worship anything that isn't a true God, our Father in heaven, who sent Jesus Christ. So, later during Domitian's reign, he began persecuting Christians more and more openly. And so, becoming or being a visible Christian became more and more likely to get you into trouble, just like it can do in many countries around the world today, including modern-day Turkey. Although not quite to the extent today as in ancient times, thankfully. Domitian was also a strongly pagan emperor, who zealously worshipped the Greco-Roman pantheon of false gods, particularly Jupiter and Minerva, and that reflected the social climate of the time, which again forced Christians into becoming dangerously different. And John, as a prominent church figure who was filled with the Holy Spirit, had been noticed by the authorities and shipped off to imprisonment on that small rocky island of Patmos. Can you imagine how he would have felt? Here was a good man who had fought for the gospel of Jesus, boldly sharing the message of God's amazing love and our need to come to him for the abundant forgiveness he offers through Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross. And yet, John's ministry, his friendships, and even his most basic comforts were dashed away from him. The unfairness of it all was astonishing, and the temptation for him would have been to tie himself up into a knot of bitterness and despair. But how did he respond to fear and difficulty and hopelessness? Well, with worship and praise. Amazing. Despite the situation he was in and everything he was going through, he knew that God still loved him and had a good plan for his life. And so we see in chapter 1 verse 10 that on the Lord's Day, one Sunday, 
He was in the spirit. He was praying, he was worshipping, he was drawing himself close to God. And so, in the middle of this dark cave, in this hopeless place, God rewards John's faith. With this great vision, this awe-inspiring revelation, John's mind is whisked to the heavens, where, at the sight of Jesus Christ, no longer in his wounded human body, but crowned and enthroned in resurrection glory, John immediately bows down in fear and wonder, just like the prophet Isaiah had done when he saw God in a great vision, just like Peter had done when witnessing for the first time the miraculous power of Jesus. Now John's first reaction is fear at the sheer otherworldly supernatural power and glory of the Lord God Almighty himself. And can you imagine reacting any differently? being brought face to face with God himself. I can't imagine feeling any other way. But for John, that fear quickly turns into reassurance. As Jesus tells him, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And John can finally see, literally, that all of God's power, majesty and glory are on his side. No matter what the world has been throwing at him and no matter what the world throws at us, as Christians, we need to realize, we need to have a vision within us of just how great the power is of the God who is on our side, how he is bigger than the problems and the fears that we face. Even in the darkest place on earth, we can have the deepest security in Christ when we respond to difficulty with worship and recognize his truth and power. Are you going through a time of sadness, hopelessness, or even a time of, of persecution? When you lovingly stand up for God and humbly share the good news of Jesus with those around you, do those people you love put you down and discourage you? Well. Exactly the same thing happened to John the prophet, Paul the apostle, Jesus' disciples, and even Jesus himself. The encouragement we see in the life of John the prophet is to keep worshipping, keep praying, keep being in the spirit, no matter what. And then your reward will come. A greater knowledge of the presence of God in your life, a greater vision of his power and glory as the God who stands behind you with you every step of the way. No matter how others might try to stop you, keep on being bold and being a pure and beautiful light for God in the world around you that so desperately needs to hear about Jesus.